Welcome to the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series. Tonight's talk, Making Astronomy Accessible, with Timothy Rue and Margaret Carruthers of the Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Summers of the Office of Public Outreach, and it is my joy and pleasure to be with you every month. And it's also my joy and pleasure to always thank the tech team, Thomas Marufu and Jan Grant Justice, who enable all of this to get out to you every single month. I will note again that um, the Space Telescope Public Lecture Series is now permanently online only. Apologize to those of you in the Baltimore area who used to come and visit us in person, but that is no longer available. Our upcoming talks, well, I'm in the process of booking all of 2024, um, and I have a lot of, uh, of talks done, but I don't have the next couple. Um, quite specified, okay? So December 5th, there will be a talk and the topic and speaker are TBD and I will get them to you, don't worry, I always do. Um, on January 9th, we have Elena Manhavas, Manhavakas, I gotta learn, I always have to learn how to pronounce the names, um, who will be talking about failed stars and errant planets. So stars that aren't quite, the, the stars and planets that aren't doing what they should be doing. In February, we will have a TBD speaker or we will have a talk on the April 2024 total solar eclipse. We're in the midst of booking a total solar eclipse speaker and we haven't been, uh, we haven't gotten it uh, down whether they want to do it in February or whether they want to do it in March. But there will be a talk on that, that total solar eclipse because, hey, Total solar eclipses are really cool, and this one's coming right across the United States, yet like the one in 2017. To find out when we have booked these uh, lectures, uh, you can go to our website, www.stsci.edu slash public hyphen lectures, um, and you will find this web page here. Um, and in the lower left, you'll see links to our webcast, both on the Space Telescope webcasting site, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, and in the lower right, you will see the email subscription box. Enter your email, hit subscribe, and you'll get our one or uh, a two or three emails a month about the public lecture series. Also on our website will, of course, be these links to our upcoming lectures. And after our lecture has been recorded, all the details about the of the lectures, including links to the STSCI webcasting site, as well as its um, uh, place on YouTube. For email, as I said, it's easiest just to sign up at our website. Uh, but if you don't want emails, emails are passe for you. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, that by signing up, you will get new video notices and reminders of live events such as this. Also, if you have comments or questions, you can send them to the email address publiclecture at stsci.edu. You can also follow the Space Telescope Science Institute on social media. We do social media for the Hubble Space Telescope, for the Webb Space Telescope, and for our Institute STSCI. Um, on Facebook, on X, on YouTube, and on Instagram. Actually, we don't run the NASA Webb Telescope YouTube. Um, that is run el elsewhere, but that is the, that is the, the primary uh, YouTube site for uh, the Webb Space Telescope. And I know people will want to wa follow that on Instagram as well. Uh, I myself sometimes do some, some social media uh, as Dr. Frank Summers on Facebook and X. Our news from the universe for November 2023. The first story tonight, sunspots and correlations. So let's discuss sunspots first, okay? Here are two pictures of the sun, one from November 2011 and one from February 2019. These were taken by the same observatory, SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. And what you notice is that there are a lot of sun sunspots in 2011, but there are none in 2019. And that is true, that the sunspot, sun will have lots of sunspots and then it'll have 
very few sunspots, sometimes no sunspots, okay? The sun goes through what we call the solar cycle. Um, and here's a gorgeous image from the SOHO satellite showing the solar cycle from 1996 to 2006. And you can see in 1996 and 2006, it was relatively quiet, but in between it ramps up, it has lots of solar activity and then ramps back down. This is an 11 year cycle, all right? Which is observable very, very nicely in ultraviolet. It's also observable in counts of sunspots. So here are sunspot numbers over the dec uh, over the centuries, actually going back to about 1750. Um, and you can see that there's a rise and a fall and a rise and a fall. Again, this 11 year cycle uh, for it. And it reminds me of a really strange graph I saw when I was growing up, okay? Um, and the graph looked a little bit like this, okay? Um, I've hidden some of the data because I'll show it to you in, in a second. But from about 1960 to the year 1986, there was a correlation between the number of sunspots and some other figure, okay? Um, and you can look at this graph and go, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe there's, some, so there, there's a reason for this correlation. Um, but I do not think there is a reason because the correlation is with the number of Republican senators in the U.S. Senate. Yeah. Um, this was one of these famous things. Uh, this is actually from a, a scientific paper uh, warning about the uh, dangers of trying to infer correlations with things that are totally unrelated, okay? That you can find correlations between things that are unrelated, um, but they don't ne aren't necessarily meaningful. Um, and then the paper goes on to show you that after the year 1986, the correlation goes away, okay? Um, so it's something I remember from my, my, uh, I don't know, I guess it was my youth back then, um, that, you know, sunspots correlate with centers at least for a little while, but it's not the only surprising correlation with sunspots. Recently, the Hubble Space Telescope showed us there might be a correlation with the number cloud cover on Neptune. All right. So. Here is, Hubble's been up there, and one of the great things that Hubble does for planetary science is it takes decades and decades uh, worth of observations of the planets. And so by looking over and over and over at the planets, we get to watch the weather change on other planets. And here you can see that just like the sun, Neptune goes through times when there are a lot of clouds, and then times when there are almost no clouds, such as in 2020, right? Um, and would you think that there is a correlation with sunspots? Well, obviously, yes, because I'm talking about it in this news summary. But actually, as an astronomer, I would say no. Naively, I would say, well, first of all, Neptune is 30 times further away from the sun than Earth is. Okay, that means that the solar activity, the strength of it as it spreads out across that, that huge sphere is one nine hundredth the, the strength it is here at Earth. So it's, look, it's one one th about one one thousandth the strength out there. So you wouldn't expect solar activity to do much of anything out at Neptune. So the surprising result is that, yes, there is a correlation. Okay, um, and here is a plot of uh, solar activity uh, as gauged by solar ultraviolet radiation um, versus some imagery of Neptune showing how the, the, the cloud cover is correlated and there's peak UV radiation. There seems to be peak uh, cloud cover on, on, on Neptune. And the reason for this is that this ultraviolet radiation hits the upper atmosphere of Neptune and ignites some photochemistry that makes chemical changes that happen uh, high up in, in, in the upper atmosphere that lead to this cloud cover. Uh, this is very surprising to me because I really, really didn't think that, that it was going to be, uh, it could be that, um, that strong out 30, at 30 astronomical units, but it appears it is. So, so it's a wonderful result um, that shows that, you know, the, the sunspots do correlate with things within our solar system and out to a distance much further than one would naively expect. Our second story tonight is NGC 346 revisited yet again. 
So if you are a regular watcher of our public lecture series, you may know that in February of this year, I talked about this star forming nebula NG3C346. And I showed you that Hubble, just Hubble, uh, had released not one, not two, but three different portraits of NGC 346, the blue one, the pink one, and the black and white one. And there are subtle differences between them, uh, most notably that the black and white de-emphasizes the stars and emphasizes more of the, ga the gas and dust in it. Uh, as opposed to the, the pink and, and, and blue ones, you know, you've got the, the much brighter star clusters there. And then I showed you that comparing that blue Hubble observation to the new Webb telescope near infrared view of NGC 346. And here you get a much greater contrast, okay, because you're going between visible light and near infrared light, and you see that wonderful star cluster in visible light but it's not really there in infrared light. Uh, the bright dust clouds in infrared light show up as dark dust clouds or even not even there at all. Um, there are these spur of, of, ga of, of, of dust stretching up to the top that is visible in infrared that's not shown in the visible. Okay, so I'll show you the contrast between visible and near infrared. Well, Webb has looked at it yet again not with the near cam, the near infrared camera, but with MIRI, the mid infrared instrument. So here is what NGC 346 looks like in the mid infrared. Ooh, cool. This is like a, even more colorful and it is yet another way of looking at the same nebula. All right, you see that same dust structure that you see uh, in uh, the near infrared, but you also see some extra dust and this red and orange uh, and yellow stuff right in the center that you do, don't see. So what we end up with is three different views of NGC 346, each of them showing just a slightly different view of the components. Uh, one emphasizing star, the, 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 the hot stars, one emphasizing the dust, one emphasizing um, the, 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 the diffuse dust. Um, the near infrared also emphasizes the low mass stars, whereas the visible emphasizes more of the high mass stars. Um, and this, I felt, was a excellent representation of why astronomers love this era of multi-wavelength astronomy. Being able to get high resolution images in visible, near infrared, and mid infrared, putting them together teaches us so much more about the objects in the universe. Um, and it's just wonderful that over my lifetime, I've seen this amazing development of multi wavelength astronomy. Okay, our speakers tonight are my colleagues in the Office of Public Outreach, uh, Timothy Rue and Margaret Carruthers. And they have been each been here uh, for about seven years uh, in the Office of Public Outreach working in their various things. Tim is the Principal Informal Education Specialist in the Office of Public Outreach, um, which means he works on projects that go out to museums and planetariums and other ways of getting uh, education to the public, but not through formal education classrooms. Uh, formerly, he came to us from he came to us from the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Uh, we are very lucky to to have stolen him away from um, then, um, and where he worked there for about five years. Margaret um, is her title is let's I got to read this sorry Deputy Branch Manager of Writing and Design here in the Office of Public Outreach. Um, she actually has been trained as a science writer herself. Uh, she and I actually worked at the American Museum of Natural History at the same time about 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Um, and she says that we rode the elevator together but didn't say hi because we didn't know each other back then. And it's, as you know, New York City. Um, uh, she is uh, trained as a geologist and has a master's degree in planetary geology. Uh, she's even written some kids' books on Earth and solar system 
uh, for, for the children. So, Tim and Margaret, uh, you're supposed to have turned on your cameras by now. <laughs> there you go. You're supposed to be there while I'm introducing you so you can, you can smile. <laughs> Sorry about that, Frank. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Wonderful. All Thank right. you, Frank. All right, so this is going to be a tag team, all right? And from what I understand, Tim's going to start first. So I'm going to turn off my camera and pass it off to, ladies and gentlemen, Timothy Rue. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for the introduction, Frank. I think Margaret's going to pull up some slides here for us to share so you can look at all of the wonderful work that we've been creating here. Um, so we, along with Frank and, and many other folks, work to bring astronomy to the public. Um, most of the folks here at Space Telescope do scientific research, or they work to keep the telescopes functional, improve their efficiency. They help astronomers all around the world use them, and, and much, much more. Um, but in my opinion, we have some of the most fun jobs, Margaret, Frank, me, um, and a few others. We get to find ways to share the science of the heavens with everyone. Um, we do this in a lot of different ways. This, this public lecture series is one of those, but there are a, a lot of other things that we work with. And I've got a couple images here that we'll show you just to give you a little bit of a picture of it. So uh, next, we have uh, an image of Jupiter, and uh, that's from the Hubble Space Telescope. Very famous. And uh, we have a web image of Herbig Haro 211. Everything that we do here really starts with processing these images for the public and bringing them out in a way that everyone can enjoy that visual appeal that can appeal to uh, really make emotional reactions with folks. On the next slide, um, we take a lot of those images, and then we go beyond that. Um, a lot of the stuff needs a little additional interpretation of the data for many of the folks who aren't as familiar with it as the regulars here in the lecture series might be. Um, we have on the left here uh, a galaxy spectrum uh, that is picking out particular elements that were found uh, in this in the light coming from this particular galaxy. On the bottom right, we've got a comparison. This is an infographic that compares the Nancy Grace Roman upcoming space telescope with the Hubble and the Webb space telescopes. And at the top right, we've got an artist's conception of a planet. Um, these, these illustrations are often really important when we're trying to talk about uh, science where we don't get proper images. Um, it gives people a picture and a way to connect in with the story and the really amazing science that's there. On the next slide, uh, we another piece that we do is we put together those news packages that go out to the press and from there to the world to share the biggest pieces of the science that are being done. Uh, those news packages include images, articles, captions, social media. Um, this is how we get everything out to everyone. Next, uh, we also create uh, articles. We write articles that help interpret the nuance in some of the fundamental concepts of astronomy. So many people uh, get the headline, but there's so much more. Astronomers are always baffled, it seems, in those headlines. And when we go into these articles, we can explain a little bit more about why exactly that is and what's going on there. On the next slide, uh, we have a couple videos, visualizations, and interactives. So we share that nuance in ways other than just articles. People like to learn in all sorts of different ways. On the left here, you can see a uh, visualization uh, that Dr. Frank Summers has put together. Uh, and on the right, uh, that those I should say first, those visualizations are pieces that are taking that actual data and finding ways to put it into uh, a format that people can see. Um, we'll, and then we will take those visualizations and we'll create videos um, and we'll include other elements, graphical pieces, to help interpret what's going on, help people understand the science behind that. We also create interactives like what's pictured on the right. Uh, Margaret's gonna show you a little more detail about one of these interactive sliders a little later, but it's a piece that people can actually play with to get a little bit more hands-on with the data um, and they can manipulate it and look at things in different ways. Uh, we also do a number of events around the country on the next slide. Um, and these help give us a chance to work directly with 
people, both young and old. Um, it's always great to get out there and see what everyone really is thinking about science, see the joy on their faces, see those faces light up as they learn all of this amazing stuff. Um, on here, you'll see pictures mostly of younger people, but that's mostly just because they're cuter and we like to look at them a little bit more. Uh, the next slide. We have programs and possibilities. So we are always looking for ways to, to go beyond. How can we, how can we out there with folks? But uh, we love to work at a, a number of things around the country, getting a chance to work with people, young and old. We've got a couple different events here. Um, you can see a few families, you can see a few young ki uh, kids here. Um, and it's always great to see those faces light up as they really get what those concepts are, or those, those, those neat, pieces of astronomical information. Um, so uh, on the next slide, we're going to see programs and possibilities. Uh, we're always looking for ways to create more in-depth possibilities, both by ourselves and in partnership with others. Um, on the left here, we have a young girl who's uh, using microobservatory at one of our Girls Steam Ahead with NASA events. Uh, this is a whole set of programs looking to engage more people um, with uh, the content that is out there and, and makes up this universe that we live in. And she's actually taking NASA data and she's creating her own visualization of this using some basic software that we've got open for, for anyone to be able to use. Um, and it it's really opens up people to realize this is something that anyone could get involved in. At the bottom, we have a uh, person from 60 Minutes In filming um, some of us here at Space Telescope learning about uh, what exactly there is uh, out in the universe. And on the right, we have somebody, a VIP visitor who came in and uh, you can see she's in a wheelchair, but she's getting a chance to explore the universe herself through, the, through VR. Uh, Web VR is a program that we've created here so that people can swoop around the James Webb Space Telescope, see it in three dimensions. Uh, it's free, it is online, anybody can download it, and it lets you really explore the science that Webb is exploring. You can see some of the discoveries on there, you can throw stars into a black hole, you can create your own planet, all sorts of exciting things to do there. Um, and we love working with other folks to build a lot of these pieces. So as we go through all of this, we're doing this in order to make the world's astronomical information accessible to all. Um, what does that mean? What does accessible really mean? Well, we mean, I mean, to use the word in the definition of itself, that everyone can access it. That means digitally, that they can find it online using whatever device or whatever connection they have. Economically, um, they can be able to afford what we've got and what we're putting out, everything that we create, that we put out for free for folks. Um, geographically, no matter where you are in the United States, we want to make sure that you have got access to these pieces, you can use them. Physically, there are some folks who physically might have issues using um, particular interactions. We want to create ways that anyone can. Uh, sensorily as well, if you can't see, if you can't hear, you still should be able to access the universe. Culturally, are we making sure that no matter where you come from, who you are, this stuff is, is stuff that works for you cognitively, et cetera. There's all sorts of different ways. We've spent a lot of time thinking, not just about these big categories, but how can Christina or Ibrahim or Inez or Taylor, how can they access this information? So a lot of what we're trying to do, one of the challenges that, that comes in sharing of this astronomy data comes from how we've treated that data historically. I mean, astronomy has been around for a long time. Um, it used to be that you had to put an eye to the eyepiece in order to gather data about what was out there. Um, Frank was just talking about his past, about reading scientific papers in his, use, in, in his youth. Um, I've heard that the Orion Nebula is one of his favorite objects. I was actually able to pull up a picture of him in his undergraduate days observing it. I think we've got that here. There it is. Um, so that's what, it, that's what it used to be like hundreds of years ago. Um, but in all seriousness, early astronomers, their only options were to be able to describe or maybe draw what they saw when looking through a telescope. Um, we've got a picture from Charles Messier in 1774. This is one of the, uh, the famous Messier with who all the Messier objects are named after. Um, this is his drawing of the Orion Nebula. 
little bit later, we have John Herschel's drawing from 1838. Uh, this is an attempt to be as accurate as possible so that he could monitor the nebula for changes. He would go back and draw it again uh, at, at later dates. Um, eventually, photography was invented, and we we're able to capture these photons, not just with our eyeballs, but on glass plates and later film. And that allowed us longer exposures to gather more light and more detail. Right here, we have a the first photo of the Orion Nebula uh, by Henry Draper in 1880. And we also, I believe, have a photo from uh, the Mount Wilson 100-inch Hooker Telescope. And you can see as we've gotten new technology, we're able to capture more detail in there. Even more recently, we've used CCDs. Uh, here we have a picture from 2006. Uh, we have the Hubble Space Telescope up in space, capturing this information, uh, capturing this on uh, as bits and bytes and sending those back down to Earth. With these most recent ones, we can even capture photons that our eyes cannot see, including outside the visible spectrum. Um, even with photography, we were able to use longer exposures and let the photons build up on a particular place so we could get uh, details, again, that our eyes couldn't see. At one point in our history, all of this was visual data, and that's why so much of our material has been visual, but it doesn't really have to be. We're now working to go beyond those historical constraints. We're looking for alternative ways to describe images. We're exploring ways uh, to display data that people can hear or that they can touch. Um, and we're working with people who have experience, particularly lived experience, um, in working with the world in all of these different ways so that we can do this better. So uh, I'm going to pass it over to Margaret, who's going to talk a little bit about how we've been describing these images. And when she's done, I'll come back and talk a little bit more about how we let you actually reach out and touch the stars. So I'll pass it to you, Margaret. Thank you, Tim. Um, <clears throat> yes, thanks very much, Tim. That was a wonderful <laughs> introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about alt texts before. <laughs> uh, Tim showed us these, you know, quite beautiful images of the Great Orion Nebula. Um, and as he was mentioning before, you know, a lot of our um, outreach, a lot of our communication is really image-based. Um, how can it not be with these uh, incredible images? They engage the public, they help us explain things, they help us understand the universe. Um, but not everybody can access these images. So if we can't share these, you know, we have to be able to share this imagery um, in other ways or else we're really not uh, meeting our goal of reaching um, everyone, making the world's astronomy accessible to everyone, to the world, to the whole world. Now, how do you go about that? How can you share something as beautiful <laughs> um, and complex and interesting as the Great Orion Nebula with those who can't um, see it? Well, you know, this isn't a new problem. In fact, it's a very old problem and it has a pretty simple solution, which is you share it with words. Um, and this is, I just wanted to share of just a few early descriptions of the Orion Nebula. <clears throat> Um, as Tim was noting, you know, when, first of all, you know, objects are hard enough to see uh, with just your eyes um, in the first place, then telescopes come along, but really only a few people have access to them. Um, even then, if people, you know, before photography is invented, we have drawings, but even those are hard to kind of transmit, um, to communicate to other people, to share. Words are a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> one of the uh, early astronomers who looked at the Orion Nebula, Giovanni Battista Hordierna, described it as some unresolvable luminosity in whose middle can be seen three stars. And next to that is um, his drawing. Uh, Guillaume Le Gentil, who was a French astronomer, described it. Hope you can see that. Hope you can see his drawing. It's quite interesting. He described it as the shape of the open jaws of some animal toward the west, an extension of light forming a rectangle. This light is very diffuse. The four stars in the center appear extraordinarily brilliant. Now, as we get uh, uh, further along with um, the technology, uh, 
better views of the universe. And Tim had uh, shared this drawing by John Herschel in 1838. Herschel also had this wonderful description in addition to his very quite realistic uh, drawing. His description was a curdling, it looked like a curdling liquid or surface strewn with flocks of wool, like the breaking up of a mackerel sky. Uh, another astronomer, George Phillips Bond, described it quite differently as a maze of radiating spiral-like wreaths of nebulosity or filamentous tentacles. And <clears throat> again, as we move move into um, more and more, you know, detailed photography, um, better telescopes, we get a clear picture, also more detailed descriptions. This description um, is from Mary Proctor. She was a science writer and science educator, um, late 1800s, early 1900s, and has some just beautiful writing, beautiful books. Um, she described the Orion Nebula <clears throat> um, pulling from others' descriptions as well. She says, it can be plainly seen with an opera glass, but in a telescope, this irregular mass of gas, to quote Professor, Professor Barnard, vaguely resembles a ghostly bat flitting through the night of space. Thousands of stars blazing with resplendent light weave a delicate tracery of glowing suns amid the silvery masses in the nebula, which in turn seems to curve and wind around the whole constellation of Orion to judge from the revelations made by long exposed photographs. Here are indeed, as Tennyson has poetically described it, regions of lucid matter taking form, brushes of fire, hazy gleams, clusters and beds of worlds, and bee-like swarms of suns and starry streams. Which, I don't know about y'all, but I think that's just a beautiful <laughs> description. And that Tennyson is from, I believe, 1833. So why am I even <laughs> bringing this up? Um, it's just to, to make the point that there are many, many ways to describe a complex and unfamiliar scene. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> the ways that we describe, um, the universe in words are the ways that we describe many things. So we use imagery to describe imagery, imagery being, you know, a very basic fundamental, uh, literary device. Um, and secondly, that the need to use words and not rely solely on images is nothing new. Um, we've spent many, many, many years in that situation. In fact, it's only recently that we really um, have been able to share uh, our um, images um, so, uh, so easily around the world. All right, so to get to um, what we're doing here, um, what is alt text? Well, alt text is a certain type of description, uh, description for the digital age. Um, alt text is uh, words, so that could be phrases, sentences, paragraphs, however you wanna arrange them, that describe a digital image. Um, alt text is called alt text because it is an alternative. Um, to the image, an alternative for those who can't access the image uh, for physical reasons, for example, a visual impairment, but also say a technological reason. Um, in fact, it was developed originally because <clears throat> when our, you know, uh, bandwidth was pretty narrow and, um, you know, when images weren't loading, you'd say, what is this image? What, what is, well, you know, am I, should I even wait and wait for this image to load? What is it gonna show me? Um, uh, we still have similar problems today, whether it's um, if you live in an area that doesn't have great internet access, or maybe like me, um, your whole family is taking it all up, or the squirrels chewed through the line, you might have a problem getting the uh, imagery to come up. Um, alt text uh, can be read aloud by a screen reader. Um, this is <clears throat> uh, like a program on your computer that will read um, read the text aloud. And so all text is designed to be read aloud. Um, it may or may not be visible or easily accessible to someone without a screen reader. So if you're not aware of all text, it might be because you don't use it and, um, and you don't rely on it, um, but many other people do. Um, but other types of alt texts um, uh, are is 
can be visible to, to everybody. Um, and finally, alt text can be very brief. It can be something as simple as a picture of a dog, or it could be very detailed with a description of the fur on the dog and what the dog is doing and, um, uh, you know, great detail and what's going on in the image. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you um, what I mean, what we're doing here at STSCI <clears throat> in terms of alt text. We have really two main types, um, standard alt text. Uh, so when you go to, say, Hubble site and look at um, our, an image, what you'll see um, is the image, you'll see the title, you see the caption, you might have a link to the article, you'll have a lot of information on there. What you probably won't see is this uh, text here that's in green. This is the alt text. It's, you can see it on this um, screenshot because I have an extension on my browser that allows me to display the alt text. And I actually use that for work to make sure that <clears throat> Um, we actually have the alt text um, and that it's loading properly. Um, but for those who um, use a screen reader, this is the text that the screen reader will read. And it's in the HTML on the right, um, kind of shows the, the HTML, the, gosh, I, I'm having trouble with the terminology here, but in any case, you can actually um, access this by inspecting the accessibility, accessibility um, uh, elements in, in your, your image. Um, one thing to know about standard alt text, you'll see that here, this description, and this is Saturn, actually, it's an ultraviolet image from Hubble um, of Saturn, but that description is quite long. A lot of times, alt text has a very tight character count, maybe 60 characters or 120. Um, we've increased the character count to give us a little more space to describe these um, objects in more detail. Um, the second type of alt text that we have, uh, we refer to as extended descriptions. Um, they serve the same purpose. They describe um, describe the graphic or the image, but they are uh, there's two differences here. One, there's no character count, so we can be as long as we want. Um, secondly, it's easily accessible not just by a screen reader, but also to someone who doesn't use a screen reader. You can just click on that on the lower left corner. You see that says view description. You click on that and you get the text that's shown over at the right there. <clears throat> now, this infographic here, what we have here is an infographic showing uh, evidence for the uh, molecules found in the atmosphere of a hot gas giant planet many, many, many light years away. Um, it's a very complex infographic. <clears throat> you can see there's a lot of information in there, and um, it would be pretty hard to describe adequately in 60 characters. It's hard to describe in 1,000, and so we um, have this extra uh, other way of describing it. Um, this, I just want to point out that all text just remind um, you all that all text doesn't stand on its own. Um, it's part for us as part of a larger package. It's just one of the um, uh, mechanisms we use to describe um, imagery and phenomena. In this case, a screen reader would read um, <clears throat> pretty much everything you see on the screen here. It would read the, the title, it would read the captions, it would read the main text, it would read um, uh, the image titles. Um, the screen reader just can't read um, text that's like part of an image. <clears throat> so, how do we figure out what to write? Um, composing alt text uh, is quite similar to composing any other text. <laughs> we have to consider um, the content and the purpose of the image. Um, so for example, you know, what is the image showing, but also why is it there? Um, we have to think about the audience. And when we think about the audience, we're thinking about, you know, not just who they are, but, you know, 
what they're bringing to the table, what they already know or don't know, but also why are they there? Are they there for entertainment? Are they there to learn? Are they there because they're stuck at the MBA and don't have anywhere else to go? <laughs> um, uh, think about, you know, what the audience is looking for when they're looking at these images. Um, you think about the context. You have to consider the context of the image. Is it within an article? Is it sitting on its own? Is it on social media? And again, medium, which is part of context, but the medium also has to do with um, uh, technological constraints, like um, on the platform formerly known as Twitter, you have a, a character count of a thousand, um, a thousand characters. So we can we can write a good amount, but we can't go cr too crazy. And again. When you write alt text, it's really just like pretty much any other type of writing. <laughs> you have content, purpose, audience, context, and medium. So I'm going to give you show you a few examples here, and I am also going to call on my handy assistant um, to help me um, with these. <laughs> we have, thank you. Um, we have is a simulated simulation voice um, of um, STSCI Tim is what I call him. Um, <laughs> and um, so this image here, uh, I hope that you recognize it. Um, <laughs> but just in case you've forgotten, um, this is the Cosmic Glyphs in the Carina Nebula. It is one of the first images that we re released from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a beautiful, beautiful star forming region, absolutely gorgeous. And um, in addition to the caption and this beautiful image and the article and, uh, you know, the social media, we wanted to write, we wanted to release very detailed descriptions because we really, you know, here's the thing. July 2022, we had just launched this amazing telescope, right? And everybody was, oh, is it going to work? What's it going to show? I don't even, like, ah. Oh. So, and, you know, we saw this stuff coming in. I, I had the very, I was very fortunate to be um, part of the team, seeing this stuff come in. And really, we just we needed to share it and, and and the idea that there would be people out there who wouldn't be able to um see these and, and experience these images um fully is just like i it's heartbreaking really <laughs> so so we wanted to make sure that didn't happen um so anyway tim uh as tsci tim could you please read this uh description the image is divided horizontally by an undulating line between a cloudscape forming a nebula along the bottom portion and a comparatively clear upper portion. Speckled across both portions is a star field showing innumerable stars of many sizes. The smallest of these are small, distant, and faint points of light. The largest of these appear larger, closer, brighter, and more fully resolved with eight-point diffraction spikes. The upper portion of the image is bluish and has wispy, translucent, cloud-like streaks rising from the nebula below. The orangish cloudy formation in the bottom half varies in density and ranges from translucent to opaque. The stars vary in color, the majority of which have a blue or orange hue. The cloud-like structure of the nebula contains ridges, peaks, and valleys, an appearance very similar to a mountain range. Three long diffraction spikes from the top right edge of the image suggest the presence of a large star just out of view. Thank you. So I hope that you all enjoyed that as much as I did. And um, I, I need to share a, a small story about this, which is that this image, um, like I said, this was part of the, uh, the first images um, to be released from web. We were working very, we were working very hard to get everything together. Um, and the writer who was working on this particular uh, news release had a lot of other com pieces to to um, work on. So um, she asked me if I could help out. I said, sure. But I, you know, I started, I sat down to try to write about it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, where do I start? This thing is so beautiful. How do you do it justice? What, uh, you know, I was kind of paralyzed, honestly. So, you know, I was talking to my supervisor, who is a designer here. Um, 
And he said, oh, how can I help? What can I help you with? Um, and I said, I don't know. Could you just help me write this? He's like, okay, sure, I'll take a shot. Now he's a designer. His title is not writer. He's actually a very good writer. And he really drafted this. And, and I think what's interesting about this is that if you look carefully at the description, you can kind of see the designer's eye. I never would have thought to say the image is divided horizontally by an undulating line between a cloudscape. But he's just looking at it from that kind of compositional perspective. And, and that's all just to say that um, um, the inspiration for these descriptions can come from many places and you do not have to be a professional writer to write them. Um, Right, the second one, I also hope that you see is familiar. This one is also, this was the first image released um, uh, to the public from Webb. It was actually revealed by President Biden. No pressure on us to get that together. And um, it uh, has a very evocative title of uh, SMAX 0723. It's actually a deep field. It shows a lot of distant galaxies and um, STSCI Tim, would you mind re reading this one? All right. This page shows many overlapping objects at various different distances. They include foreground stars, galaxies in a galaxy cluster, and distorted background galaxies behind the galaxy cluster. The background of space is black. Thousands of small galaxies appear across the image. Their colors vary. Some are shades of orange, others are white. Most appear as fuzzy ovals, but a few have distinctive spiral arms. In front of the galaxies are several foreground stars. Most appear blue with diffraction spikes, forming eight-pointed star shapes. Some look as large as the galaxies that appear next to them. A very bright star is slightly off-center. It has eight blue long diffraction spikes. In the center of the image, between four o'clock and six o'clock, in, in the bright star spikes are several bright white galaxies. These are members of the galaxy cluster. There are also many thin, long orange arcs. They follow invisible, concentric circles that curve around the center of the image. These are images of background galaxies that have been stretched and distorted by the foreground galaxy cluster. Thank you. So what I want you to notice in here is that um, in, in addition to like the just the description of what you see here, we do have a bit of interpretation or explanation. Um, uh, especially at the end, talking about the gravitational lensing, um, these galaxies that have been, the, the light has been all distorted by the, um, the mass of the galaxy cluster in the foreground. Um, and that's very deliberate. Um, it's, it's intended to make sure that the reader, the audience is making the connection um, between what's shown in the image and what's in the caption and what's in the article. Um, you also know that to write this, it did require a good bit of background knowledge. It would be very hard to write um, all of that um, if you didn't already know a lot um, about, about the image. Um, <clears throat> so this one <clears throat> um, is a little bit different. This is also shows, um, one of the objects or features that we uh, presented in the web's first um, set of first images, Stefan's Quintet, which is a group of interacting galaxies with one sort of photobombing in the foreground. Um, but this, this particular graphic, um, the purpose of the graphic is really not to show off the image, it's actually a reference graphic. It's what we call a compass image. So it has a scale bar on it. It has the compass um, arrows showing the orientation in the sky. It also shows the color mapping, which is basically saying, okay, this is a this is a mostly infrared image. So the light that we see in the image that you see here is it's invisible to our eyes. So we had to basically translate it into visible light colors. And the, um, the legend at the bottom tells you that. So likewise, the description really does focus on um, the reference elements of this compass image. It does not really talk much about the, what the galaxies look like or what's going on in there. You can see in the second paragraph, really, we just say, in the center is an image of Stefan's Quintet, a group of five large bright galaxies. Um, and that's okay, because we actually do have what we call a clean image. 
of showing just the galaxies, and that has a very detailed description in there. This is another example <clears throat> of, um, of <clears throat> an image that really is more for, uh, it, it, this, this image is showing the, is, is basically trying to show how large the Roman Space Telescope has a, has a camera, the uh, wide field instrument that has a huge field of view. Basically, it's like a hundred Hubble cameras next to each other <laughs> um, and with Hubble-like resolution. So this is the Roman Space Telescope, which is gonna launch in a couple of years. This uh, graphic here is really just intended to show that huge field of view of the Roman Space Telescope and also to kind of demonstrate a bit about its, um, the resolution, the how detailed of the of images that it will show. So what we have is a um, ground-based image of the Andromeda galaxy. Um, we have a image of the full moon. Um, <clears throat> these are just, this is a composite. It's not really a photograph of the moon next to the Andromeda galaxy. They're there um, just for scale. So, <clears throat> Again, the alt text, you'll notice that it does not really talk at all about what the Andromeda galaxy looks like or what the surface of the moon looks like. You could, you could go into great detail if that were the point, but the point really is scale. So we focus more on how much of the image the moon is taking up, how much of the image Andromeda is taking up, and then how much the, um, you know, <clears throat> how large that uh, footprint of that Roman uh, wide field camera is. All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> as Tim noted before, and we saw earlier, we do a lot of, um, in addition to beautiful telescope imagery, we also have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of graphs. And um, I love graphs, so <clears throat> I could spend all day looking at these graphs, honestly. Um, they're not for everybody, but I love them. This particular graph is a graph of um, amount of light blocked on the y-axis versus wavelength of light on the x-axis. What this is is a transmission spectrum. What happens is the um, it's of a exoplanet and it's showing what the exoplanet's atmosphere is made of. Basically, you measure the starlight um, first. You measure the brightness of all the different colors of starlight, the different wavelengths. Then you measure, keep measuring while the planet is going in front of the star and you see how it changes as the, as the atmosphere of that planet is filtering out some of the light. And then you make a nice graph showing how much <clears throat> light the atmosphere was blocking. Well, you know, that took a long time to explain just there. <laughs> um, and, this, you know, describing a graph um, in words takes a lot of words because, you know, that's kind of the point of a graph, right? Is it shows you a lot of data. <laughs> um, and in this particular case, uh, this was another of our early release observations. One of the, this was our first exoplanet observation. And part of the point of this graph, part was to say, hey, look, we can see water on a planet that's, I forget how far away, a thousand light years, really far away. Um, but it was also to show the astronomy community. This, these data are, amazing it is incredible so with this description we really went all out we talked about where the data points are how big the error bars are how close they align to each other where where the water peaks are etc and <clears throat> that um, required a lot of space so we put it in a in a long extended description um, there are a couple of things here that's a lot of information, but there's a couple of things here too that I wanted to point out that the extended descriptions um, allow us to do. Um, not only do they give us more space, they allow us to use formatting. And um, STSCI Tim, could you please demonstrate how a screen reader would deal with um, these headers? 
and you can describe it as well as just read it if you'd like. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll describe this a little bit because uh, unless you're used to a screen or some of it does get a little uh, confusing in there, but basically it gives what the different heading levels are and how they are nested so that people can get a quick overview of where things are. Um, often when you're using a screen reader, um, you will just read through the headings very quickly the same way that when you glance at a page, visually there are cues telling you what's the mo what are the big things and what pieces fall into that. So here we might say, oh, we've got an extended description. And then under that, we've got a, a heading level for graph. Under graph, there are headings for axes, key, data, and model. And then there's another uh, bigger heading level for background. Um, and then you can jump between each of these headings and read the specific detail, which we won't get into today. We've read a bunch to you, and we do want to keep moving along. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, so having said that, we do, you know, sometimes you want a lot of detail, sometimes you don't, depending on the context. Most people using the platform formerly known as Twitter uh, probably want a little bit less. So we, we provide shorter descriptions as well. Um, I've seen in this one that came out last year. <clears throat> and finally, um, you know, again, the what you put in alt text, again, you got to think about, you know, what is the picture showing, but why is the person, why is your audience here? What are they looking for? Uh, this is a screenshot of our video library in ViewSpace. Um, <clears throat> and in a video library, it has a bunch of thumbnails, and you know you're just trying to get an idea of what's there. Do I? And really, the images are there to engage you. They're basically there to say, "Click me, look up here, look at this." And and for the user, it's also it's there to help the user figure out, "Do I want to click on that? Do I want to spend my time?" So they don't need a really long description. Um, on the left, you see what it looks like without um, the uh, alt text. Uh, extension program in there. Um, and on the right, it shows what that alt text is. So, you know, the life and death of stars, it's good to have some alt text there, uh, multicolored supernova remnant. So, you know, it's about things in the sky and not people in Hollywood, um, but it doesn't tell you much more and that's okay. Um, another type of, uh, piece we have, Tim mentioned that we have interactives, and I'm just going to show you um, one inter uh, how these slider interactives work, because we have to write descriptions of them too. Um, we want everybody <laughs> to uh, be able to interact with them. So this kind of shows how the slider works. You slide across the slider bar at the bottom, the image changes, you can slide back and forth. Um, this is just a video showing how it works, but I encourage you all to go to ViewSpace and play with these. They are super fun. Um, and as I said, we have we need to write descriptions of these too. In this case, we are writing descriptions not only of those individual images that you saw there, which themselves are kind of can be kind of complex, but we really need to describe how everything fits together, how um, the different images. Uh, are similar and different to each other, how um, the, tr the transition works, like how it's, how it's changing as you go back and forth. A lot of our sliders show objects at different wavelengths of light, and the whole point is showing what you can see in one wavelength and not in others, so you need to point those things out. So again, we have quite extensive uh, descriptions for these. These are actually in progress right now. If you go, you will see um, a couple, but very soon you will see many, many. Okay, um, and finally, the other uh, big example I wanted to show you because I think it is an, it's one of my favorite images, actually. <laughs> um, this is an illustration, if you couldn't already tell. Um, this uh, was an illustration that came with the wrapper to the web's first images. That was like uh, one article we wrote about all of the, the images that were released. Um, the graphic designer was asked to write, to create a, a graphic to kind of like illustrating science with web conceptually. So I love this image and I loved it immediately. I think it's beautiful, um, you know, um, 
but it wasn't until I started to write the alt text for it that I also realized how smart the image is. Um, and so what we have here is, um, Tim, would you like to read this one? Sure, I can do that. The middle of this colorful graphic is a large hexagon outlined in gold. Within the hexagon is a stylized illustration of space with shapes representing objects and materials that Webb is investigating. A large planet with hints of cloud formations, beams of matter jetting out from the center of a galaxy, galaxies of different shapes and sizes, nebulous, cloudy wisps, and stars with eight-pointed diffraction patterns. The color within the hexagon grades from blue at the left to green and yellow in the middle and red at the right. The background surrounding the hexagon is a deep blue with scattered points of light of different size and brightness. Running from left to right through the middle of the graphic and behind the hexagon is a jagged line representing a light spectrum. The area below the spectrum has a rainbow pattern from purple on the left to red on the right. The coloring is semi-transparent and the blue starry background visible behind and fades out toward the bottom. Thank you. So as you can see, there, there's a lot of a lot going on in this image as well. And the, the thing I wanted to exp, um, share with you on this is that the this description that you see um, that Tim just read is not actually um, the original description. Um, I, this past summer, we had some high school students here uh, doing like an art and astronomy project. And I was talking to them about alt text and we did a, an exercise that I had actually done with some other people before, which is I read out the alt text and I have people draw it. And the point of that is, um, well, these kids were artists, so I just wanted to see what they would come up with. But the other point is really, you can, test your alt text and see how um, effective it is if you have somebody draw it. Now, sometimes you can have it just draw that in their mind. Is this what you imagined? Um, but what happened was, you know, I thought I had done a pretty good job and I was really excited to see what they would come up with. But what I noticed was they were having trouble um, and um, they were able to identify the problem actually. So we talked about it afterwards and they said, you know, I think if you talked about this first and turned around this and just, it was just an ordering issue, um, it would be better. So this uh, text you see here actually reflects that feedback and that's just extremely uh, valuable um, uh, type of feedback to have. So on that note, you know, what else do we do to make sure our alt text is effective? Um, I will try to go through this quickly, but we, you know, if you're writing text like this, it's useful to develop it at the same time you're doing the other text. A lot of times right now we're kind of doing um, things after the facts. We've got 30, after the fact, we've got 33 years of Hubble imagery <laughs> to describe. Um, but when you write it with the main text, it's a lot easier. You know what the purpose is, you know who your audience is, and you know what the content is. Um, it's good to put all text through um, the same rigorous editorial process that you put any other type of, of um, text through. That is, in, in our case, we, um, you know, have a general editorial review. Um, we put it through subject matter expert because you don't want to uh, introduce misconceptions or, or, or I misidentify things, call something a star when it's actually a galaxy. Um, <clears throat> so we put that and we, you know, do copy editing and that sort of thing. Um, okay, so one of the really um, important things too is involving members of the target audience. So in this case, um, members of the blind and visually impaired community, we had consultants help us out um, in, in figuring out how to approach the alt text. Um, they, you know, reviewed some of our stuff. They gave us really, uh, really valuable input. And when we're developing it, we also, um, have involved um, uh, um, members of visually impaired. Um, we Someone on our staff is visually impaired. He used a screen reader. It was great. He was able to um, review the text and give us really important feedback on that. Um, and developing and maintaining a style guide is important if you want kind of to have some consistency and efficiency, helps teach other people how, how to do this. All right, so with all that, you know, 
it might seem kind of overwhelming. I think that a lot of the, um, the work that we've done, we put a lot of work into it. We've come out with some great descriptions and that can be kind of intimidating, um, even for ourselves. Um, I know I sit down sometimes to write and think, oh man, how can I make it? <laughs> how can I make it good? But you know, um, anyone can write all text. Um, it, you don't have to be a specialist. Um, and in fact, it's really important that everybody, um, it, it's an important thing to be able to do, um, it's important to think about. Um, I think the, my first uh, tip would be psych yourself up and just keep in mind that simple alt text is better than no alt text. Just keep that in your mind. You can put picture of a bunch of stars. That is okay. That's okay. Um, if you want to go, um, you know, further, that's great, but you don't have to. Um, you don't have to describe everything. Again, you think about the point. Um, and you have a backspace key. I use the backspace key more than I probably use any other key. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, editing is part of writing. Um, and then, you know, when you want to get going, just think about the purpose. What am I trying to do here? Um, Again, think about the medium. If it's uh, Twitter, you you know you can <clears throat> you have a thousand characters to work with. It's great, um, and everybody can see your alt text. Um, uh, orient your audience. Um, you can basically one of the tricks too is you know don't just dive into the details. Give them the big picture, build the framework, and then go into the details. And only you know focus on the relevant details. All right, so um, why are we doing all this again? Um, you know, you probably noticed that we had a lot of images from web and that's because we have really put um, uh, this great effort into um, um, making sure we had really good alt text for those first images and that that was our start, uh, a uh, served as a kind of a framework to go forward, I guess. Um, and I'm hoping that you've seen all these images before. They were certainly, uh, the images themselves were very popular, went around the world. We were very successful here. You know, the thing is, we was, what was very surprising though, was that that effort that we put into the alt text did, we thought that would be kind of be behind the scenes. Um, we knew it was important, but it actually, people noticed and people started talking about it and it was just wonderful. And Tim, if you don't mind just reading a couple of these tweets. Um... Yeah. The, the, the tweets from individual people who, who were touched by this were some of the most meaningful things in this whole experience because you could tell how much this mattered and how they love these images and how, they weren't getting access to the content that they wanted. So let me let me read these. Um, this first one here uh, above the Korean Nebula, or excuse me, after, above the Cosmic Cliffs. Um, if anyone ever tells you alt text isn't import them, show them NASA's alt text for the Webb Space Telescope images. They are able to convey the wonders and beauty of these in words, making these breathtaking views accessible. And then uh, the other one, which I pull out all the time, um, I really love this one. As a blind person who has had dreams of doing astronomy since I was six, thank you to whoever not only remembered to write alt text for this, but did so in such a beautiful way. I'll likely never know who you are, but you touched my heart this day, alt text writer. Purple heart emoji. Um, yeah, so this was, thank you, Tim. Um, surprising and just wonderful. I think it was a huge, boost. I mean, we knew this was important, but to actually hear it directly from people is, is a completely different situation. It also brought um, it out into the public more, and I think it inspired others to try to write great alt text. It certainly helped us put more um, energy and resources into what we're doing. Um, it also showed, um, you know, it highlighted some other wonderful things about writing alt text, which is that you know, it's it's good for the writer. The writer gets a lot out of writing alt text. It's, you know, some people don't like it. 
I love doing it. <laughs> I know. Um, uh, you learn more. You learn a lot about the objects. Um, it's also good for those who can see um, the images uh, perfectly well because they see it in a different way because you're pointing things out. Um, so um, with that, I'm taking up some of Tim's time, but I'm going to hand it over back over to Tim, who will talk to you about another way of reaching the public um, uh, in, well, I'll let him say it. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. And you're all, you're all good. Um, so tactile images, touching things. Um, we'll jump to the next slide right away, actually. Um, so as Margaret has said, an audio description of an image is another window into our universe that allows people to explore things that they've never been able to. And even for people who have seen these images, learn about astronomy in a new way by picking out new details and emphasis. Um, Space Telescope, our, our, our work is to amaze the public. Um, really, uh, dinosaurs and space are the gateway into science for so many people. Yes, we do teach about space, but we're also, in some small way, working towards a world in which people evaluate evidence and trust in expertise, where people make choices through critical thinking and consideration of the consequences of their actions, where people aren't afraid to revise their own thinking as they learn new facts and where they can continue to grow and create a better place for everybody. So. To do this, we really do need to think about what all means. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about another way of connecting with the universe besides descriptions. Um, my background, as Frank mentioned earlier, oops, back up, back up one moment. Uh, my background is in museums. And how many of you out there remember a time that you were able to visit a museum and there was some sort of hands-on display where you got to touch the exhibit? Those sorts of experiences lie really strongly in our memory and and they also open up new ways to learn beyond just looking at these images like I've got up here these traditional space telescope images now of course reaching out and touching these sorts of things the things that Hubble Webb and other telescopes capture would be like trying to touch a cloud or a flame only a little bit more there, there wouldn't be much there to feel in most cases and and actually in some of those cases it'd probably be a little bit hazardous to our health to touch some of these things so we have uh, some tactile tactile images and tactile ways to explore this so now we'll go to the next slide here so we have been trying to create physical representations of these images for, for a long time we've played around with all sorts of different methods of doing this over the years. Um, there are raised line images that use particular textures to represent certain features. Um, you can actually see on the, the right hand side of the screen here, uh, you might be able to pick out, it's a little difficult with all of the texture going on in the image, but we have raised lines on the Carina Nebula and there are different patterns showing different pieces of that image. Um, there are 3D printed models uh, sometimes they represent shape. Sometimes they can represent something like brightness. Uh, they'll translate the, the brighter parts of an image as height. Um, and those both give you different sorts of information. Uh, here in the center, we've got a 3D model of Cass A and a 3D model of Eta Carina. And then there are uh, monochrome texture maps. Um, you can see at the bottom, this is actually uh, printed on uh, a puff paper. It's put, it's put through a, a particular printer so that you can print out images and they'll raise up depending on how dark different things. All of these do really great different things. Um, you can also see on the, the left hand side, this is uh, one of the museums that we have worked with. Um, and they've got a few other sorts of tactiles. You can see phases of the moon on here on the top left. And on the bottom, you can see there's actually a landscape of the moon there in gray. You can see a constellation in orange. She's got a few different things that she's showing, different ways that people are able to interact with it. Um, but one of my favorite methods is a, new, a fairly new to us method that combines elements of both the visuals and the tactiles in the same thing, and also combines elements of science and art in its creation. Um, 
A couple of years ago, I learned about an organization. Yeah, this is good. An organization that had been working with museums to translate art into tactile representations. These were full color replicas of art pieces with depth and texture. So you could feel the shape of a subject's face or you could feel the ripples in the water of a passing boat on a piece of art. Um, and on top of that, they incorporated sound as another sense to provide context to the details that might not be apparent to the observer. And when I saw this, I thought, oh, I've got the perfect application for this. And the first thing that we went with was this, the Pillars of Creation, a portion of the Eagle Nebula. Um, this is Hubble's famous image from 2015. Of course, there was one uh, a couple decades before then. Um, but this image is an area of star birth. It's, it's showing us gas and it's dust. It's, there are uh, really hot young stars just outside the frame of this image that are disassociating the gas and the dust in here and, and basically carving these pillars um, around these dense pockets of dust that are kind of shielding what's below. It's really cool science. It's a very dramatic image and it's something we wanted to translate uh, for everybody to be able to experience. So on the next slide, you can see this full-sized tactile exhibit that we were able to create. Um, so on the left, you'll, you'll, you can see the full image there, um, and you can see a little bit of texture. You can see a little bit of rippling around uh, the edges of the pillars where that gas and dust is kind of disassociating. You can see the diffraction spikes raised up from those stars. You can feel every each and every one of those stars on there, um, and the shapes of the pillars. And actually, those are raised at different heights, so the one that's closest to us is higher up. Um, you'll also notice there are a few buttons at the bottom which kind of describe what's going on. You press those buttons, it tells you how to work with the image, it gives you the science, it gives you the background. Um, and this sort of interpretation is really, really great for people who don't necessarily have the context about these images and want to know what things in the universe look like. I mean, how many of us, when we first saw an astronomy image, were like, wow, this is beautiful, but I have no clue what's going on here. Um, we all need a little bit of explanation as we get going, and that's what we try to give here. Um, so on the next slide, I've got a few more details of this, and you can actually see on the right hand, you see those little metal bumps that are sticking up from the image? Those are those little audio sensors, and they're, they're, they're wonderful because they're location specific. As you're moving along that tallest pillar, you can touch one that tells you that the height of this pillar is about seven light years. Um, it, it, and you can go into different ones and find out, oh, this particular thing that you're feeling is a baby star kind of emerging from the dust, or here are what diffraction spikes are, or all sorts of things. Um, as I said, so many folks don't have the context to understand what's going on in that astronomy image, and we're trying to give them a sense of what this is. The uh, next slide will show you another way in which we have, have um, shared this out. We're trying to reach as many folks as we can all around the country. Um, so instead of just one single large version, we actually created a hundred small versions. Uh, this panel that you're seeing on the screen is about one foot by one foot in dimension. Um, and they went out to museums, libraries, planetaria, along with information about the science because they don't have that audio integrated and they don't have a scientist right there to help explain what's going on. So we sent along the panel information about the science so that the facilitators who really know their audiences can learn a little of that and learn how to work with it. And we sent along guidance on running some facilitated activities with the, the um, large version that you saw on the screen before is here in Baltimore. It's actually uh, been rotating around to different branches of the Enoch Pratt Free Library. So any of you uh, Baltimoreans can go on and, and check that out. I think it took a, uh, a brief stint at the Maryland Library for the Blind and Print Disabled as well. Um, but we've been getting it into all of the different neighborhoods so people all across the city can examine it. Um, and then at the bottom of, the, uh, of this slide, you can see those small panels. Uh, one is at that museum event on the left. The, the one on the right, I think this is actually in North Carolina. That's a uh, library, uh, Aldemar Regional Library down in North Carolina where you can see that uh, pillar or the, those pillars on display and there are some people on hand to talk a little bit about what's going on there. But this wasn't enough. Um, we, we finished this in the fall of 2021 and we're like, hmm, you know, 
we've got this brand new telescope that's launching pretty soon here um, that we'd love to share with everyone. Um, so we started figuring out how we could do it. The telescope, James Webb Space Telescope, launched on Christmas Day, 2021. And while Margaret and her team were working on a lot of those descriptions and writing out how what these images looked like for folks, we were working out some of the logistics about how we can get these tactiles in place so that they are out there as soon as possible after these images go out to the public. So here we have Stefan's Quintet. Um, I know I, we've shared visualizations of this on this public lecture series before, um, and we've seen all sorts of images. This is the MIRI, the mid-infrared image. We really wanted to showcase some of what James Webb can, Space Telescope can uniquely do. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to go there and experience. I also love uh, kind of the edge, the frame on this. This isn't a square picture because it's actually pieced together from different pointings of the telescope. Um, and that's a point that people don't always realize and we're able to really uh, show with these tactiles. Um, and we also get into the science about what's going on as these galaxies interact with each other and the one, that one on the left kind of photo bombs slipping in between. Um, but again, with these, um, we got this to the folks who actually produced it on July 12th, a cu couple hours after the images were released to the public, and very shortly thereafter we had a tactile. Um, this big one was actually debuted at an event at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, um, and we started sending out 200 small versions around the country as well. Um, you can see some folks here uh, interacting with it, you can see me in the background and Dr. Quinn Hart there. Uh, in the foreground pointing out a few features to some folks. Um, that, that was a really exciting day to get down there and, and work with folks. Um, and we've also gotten all sorts of really good feedback um, about how people have benefited from them. There was um, one educator that I was able to spend a little time talking to out at the Science Zone, which is a science center in Casper, Wyoming, uh, who's visually impaired herself. She can't get find the detail visually, but she can see in color. And the fact is that, that there, are a, there, there are many, many folks out there who are blind or visually uh, impaired, but many more of them do have some, some elements of sight. She could see color. Um, and she was absolutely thrilled with this because she could piece together the color that she could see and the shapes that she could feel with her hands. And she wasn't able to get that that combination in any way before. And she got a really complete idea of what was going on in this image overall. Um, and that was just so exhilarating to see and, and, and talk to her about and hear stories about how other people have been able to bring this out uh, to new folks to experience the universe that we all take for granted at times. So uh, last slide I'm gonna show you here um, is these have not just been great for people who are blind and visually uh, impaired. They're great for everyone. We've seen a lot of kids, for example, react really positively to these images. Kids are always willing to try things out. And by putting their hands on the image, in addition to looking at it, they get a multi-sensory way to engage with that image. It draws their attention, it, it sparks their memory, it, it, it makes them, it helps them learn more, um, much more so than just the images alone. And this is true not just for kids. This is true for anybody who's able to interact with these. Um, people learn in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we often talk about visual learners and, and, and audio learners and, and tactile learners, but really the truth of it is all of us learn best when we're exposed to multiple, uh, multiple ways to learn about things in combination. Um, an image can show us color, position, and shape. Uh, when we've got sound, we both have of our, our ears are really good at picking out overlapping content and, and how to pick out different details in there. Think about listening to a song, and being able to pick out the drums versus the bass versus the vocals. Um, it also has a linearity uh, to it. So we can follow from first this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Um, when we add tactile pieces onto that, uh, we, we really build on the position and the three dimensionality of it. Um, and when we throw words in there, we can really get into a lot of the nuance and add specificity. And we can also share words in a lot of different formats through sight, people are able to read those words, audio, people can hear them, and we can also display them in braille. So combinations of all of these different things uh, really provide an ability to 
reach more people and for people to get more out of them. Um, so and we're thankful to the Cook Museum in Alabama uh, and the Cosmosphere in Kansas um, who provided some images to us of some people really getting a lot out of this. So with that, I'm going to say thank you. Um, and I think Margaret is going to come back on camera. And Frank, uh, you had some stuff for us. <laughs> Uh, this is my time to come in and ask you guys questions. Well, first of all, I always have to thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, in particular, this is a subject that has not received a, a tremendous amount of attention. And um, doing it, uh, some of the things that we've done with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a huge deal, um, then pulls in, in a, lot, a lot of attention. Um, and so, one of the things I wanted to, to highlight uh, on this is the amount of effort necessary to go into this alt text because uh, it sounds, you know, uh, you've got the uh, experts that you need to be able to understand the images. You've got sort of the designer poet type people who can actually do all these various descriptions. Um, you've got the visually impaired community who needs to have, you know, you need their input in it. I mean, how many rounds do you go in order to get these alt text descriptions to really be uh, as, as, uh, as uh, insightful as you want them to be? Very good question. <laughs> um, you know, it's like any other um, any other writing and any other communication, really. Which is that um, it, there's a balance, right? So you you could edit forever. <laughs> we could go back and forth forever. Frank knows this. Tim knows this because we work together, and sometimes it feels like forever. We're going back and forth. Um, so yeah, it, it's really important. I would say that it is important to get that subject matter expert review, to get that other reader's review. And that might be another writer, it might be an educated, education specialist like Tim, um, but somebody who's listening um, without seeing the image is really helpful. Um, in fact, this is one way we review it. Um, uh, I'll send the alt text over to somebody who's not familiar with the image. They'll try to imagine it in their head, um, and then they'll look at it. And um, and that's a really, really helpful thing. In fact, I'm very bad at left and right. And and so sometimes, <laughs> uh, one of my comments recently was, this is great, but you, f I, I saw it inverted because you switched left and right. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, uh, the other thing that the balance that I'm talking about, is that it really is important to get the alt text out there and if you stress about it too much you end up paralyzed and not doing anything which is really worse <laughs> and, um, so my recommendation is if you find that happening just go back to something simpler like if you're like i don't know if this is accurate you know what just say, look, I see a lot of, in Frank's background, I see a lot of colorful spots of different colors and shapes. You know, are they galaxies, are they stars? I don't know, but at least that is helpful. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we have got uh, some folks watching on YouTube and they have been putting some stuff into the chat. Uh, I'm going to bring Grant Justice in, who is uh, our YouTube uh, chat monitor <laughs> uh, during this. Um, and Grant, do we have some questions from the chat that we should we should bring in? We um, do. I actually want to start with one that's kind of been trickling through in different ways. Um, at least for me, I find that one of the most helpful things in learning to explain any of this to people is going and doing public events and finding out like what terminology people who aren't living in a building with astronomers use and a lot of that sort of stuff. Because um, you were mentioning before, Margaret, that you'd like to have someone who isn't necessarily a science writer or isn't necessarily like an astronomer take a look at it. Do you use like lay people like for instance like me who is not an astronomer would you like do you incorporate them into it to kind of get an outside perspective on it as well Grant's trying to see if he can add to his workload okay obviously <laughs> <laughs> um yes i do i and, and i i do it in different ways sometimes i grab someone in the hall <laughs> um uh 
one of my favorite people to send my writing to, whether it's alt text or anything, is my mom. And she is yes. an English professor, and she is the one who's really been instrumental in teaching me to write. But she doesn't, you know, she, what she knows about astronomy is what I've told her. So um, that's useful, you know. Sometimes I share them with my kids, but they're a little less mm, diplomatic about their feedback. So sometimes, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, <laughs> but yes, the answer is absolutely, definitely. It's really important. And um I'm the same when I go to public events, I'm kind of testing out how to explain things. And, and it's interesting how, you know, you'll find that a way you've been explaining something that seems perfectly fine. You suddenly talk to someone and realize, wow, they interpreted it completely differently. So, yeah. So, Tim, I had a question for you about the tactile because mm -hmm. those feel like those should take a long time to develop. Um, because, you know, I mean, we've got a news press release cycle, right? And you, these images are going to come out on the day that they come out and trying to get a tactile done in, in, that, uh, in that amount of time seems quite a feat. Um, how far in advance do you really need to, to do? Because you've got a lot it, of testing to do with the audiences and such. It does take a bit of time. Uh, there's about a two-month turnaround at the really fast point. That's what we managed for those first images from the Webb Space Telescope. We like to have a little bit more, though, and take our time because we're trying to involve scientists to review this and incorporate their voices um, into the table itself. Um, we're actually working on doing some science advice on an entire ex tactile exhibit for the James Webb Space Telescope now that's hopefully going to travel around the country. Um, and we are taking, I don't know, maybe a year trying to put this whole thing together. Um, helping the folks out who are building it. And yeah, it, there's so much that goes into it, but it also, I think so much in this work that we do is in doing it for that first time, trying to figure out how we do it. Uh, Margaret, I know, spent a lot of time workshopping before we got those first web images, um, alt text, because um, I was in some of those as well, and I got to, to have the fun of, of trying to write some stuff and, and go back and forth. But figuring out that method uh, at first, and then once you've got it down, it gets a little bit quicker. It's like anything, and this is something that anybody and everybody really should do in some ways, but it takes a little practice. Okay. Uh, Grant, is there another question <laughs> from the, or a question or two from the uh, um, chat? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we get into the question, Tim and or Margaret, um, in case anybody is in the relative area, where can they go to check out some of the tactile displays or some of the stuff you're talking about? Other than so, the website, because we know the alt yeah. text is there. <laughs> so I mentioned the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Um, I'm not sure exactly which branch it's at right now, uh, because like I said, it has been bouncing around from branch to branch. But I bet if you call them up, uh, they will let you know where it is and they can direct you to that particular one. Um, so that is one place. There are there are a few um, other places around that have the uh, tactile in the Baltimore area. Oh, the Nature Center, uh, the Robison Nature Center, is it down in? Yeah, I know the one. Yeah. Yeah, they've, I, I believe they've got one on hand and they might be a place where you can check out one of the small tactiles as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, what group of people have you found, other than obviously its intended alt text audience, has responded the most to these sort of non-traditional ways of displaying and communicating the information? Like, is it generally older audiences? Is it younger audiences? You know, I'm not sure if there's a particular age or if there's a, a particular demographic that has been responding more than any other outside of the folks who really need this and haven't been getting it. Um, <laughs> it it's, it's something that resonates with everybody, whether you're talking about the alt text or the tactiles. Um, this, is, this is moving towards something that is, it's moving towards it. 
not quite there, but it's moving towards an idea of universal design, particularly when you're incorporating the visuals and the tactiles together. It's something that really builds for everyone um, and, and, and helps them all out. Yeah, I, I mean, just, there, oh, there's a ahead. lot of discussion about, you know, alternative ways of experiencing things. Even if you are sighted, the alt text descriptions create a poetic description mm -hmm. of what's going mm -hmm. on. And um, I was at a conference this summer where they read out one of the, uh, the web descriptions and, you know, the audience was like, wow, it helped them. It, it seemed like it helped them to see more in the image, even though they'd already seen it with their eyes. Right? I'll, I'll add on to that. And, and maybe maybe Margaret was going to say this too. I don't know, but the um, as we have been developing infographics or images or things, if we are writing the alt text, that actually impacts us, and we may go back and want to change something because we noticed particular details as we were going along. I don't know if you want to add to that, Margaret. Yeah, that's actually um, that, that's a very. Uh... That's the audience that I didn't really anticipate at all, which is the audience of the creator. Um, so the writers um, who write the alt text, um, now again, it's not everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> some like to do this more than others, but the ones who, um, what I've heard is it, it allows them to, to experience the image in a different way, to see it see things they hadn't seen before. I find that myself. I wrote some alt text last night for one of the writers who was busy getting a, a press release together. It was an infographic, very detailed. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I volunteered to do this. And then as soon as I took a look, I was like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? This is going to take forever. <laughs> but, but I really enjoyed doing it because I could look at that infographic in detail and start to understand what was going on. So I think that for the writers, they learn more. Um, I think the scientists probably do too. I think scientists, when they are trying to write alt text now for their own graphics are probably, I would guess, seeing things they hadn't seen before. Um, it's really helpful with design. There's been a numerous times um, where we have to make a tweak based on the alt text. Uh, there's some graphics we have to go back and fix because as we're describing it, we're like, wait a minute, <laughs> that, that isn't quite right. And it's the type of thing you just don't necessarily notice, but you're forced to notice when you have to put all those little pieces into words, you are forced to notice it. I haven't seen this happen yet, but I do know that were I a science teacher, I would start having students write alt text um, as assignments because I think that it really forces them to look in detail at, at things. And it's fun. It is poetic. You come up with these, you know, my job isn't to write poetry, but then Claire, one of our, um, our science writers, she was actually a, a poetry minor, I think, in college, and she just loves the fact that she can come back and, mm -hmm. and apply that um, to, to it's her, her writing. It's her Friday afternoon activity when she's <laughs> done with the week and she just needs to calm down for a Yeah, little it's bit. kind of meditative. You know, some people do coloring and Claire just like writes all text. As, as someone who creates visualizations and, um, you know, creates graphics and everything, seeing how other people see it is extremely important, right? Um, you know, as you guys know, I used to bring everybody into my office and get, get all their reactions to it. Uh, this alt text thing, it, the, just descriptions are, almost, are, are the sim similar thing is, is that if you create something and then somebody else describes it back to you, you see how they're seeing it and it... Um, it, it shows you where you've been effective and where you, uh, what you thought might have been in your emphasis isn't quite there. Um, so it's, it's a very valuable feedback. All right, yeah. we're over time here. So uh, is there one more question, uh, Grant? Yes, you've got? yes. Okay, one I last can, question. I'll do one, one final. <clears throat> How do you separate the feelings and knowledge you have of the image or the observation versus the representation of the image without making it seem robotic? Hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, um, practice. <laughs> yeah, practice. But yeah. I, I, I'm, ass I, I'm assuming the person is asking, you know, like, so you could describe like the, the image behind, um, behind Tim right now, right? If I didn't know what it was, you know, you might say it looks like 
some wispy, cloudy, different colors, maybe a watercolor with some dots in the background. You know, I know that it's um, a nebula of some sort. So um, how do you separate? You know, you don't always. Um, you're not, it's kind of like every, we all come to somewhere with, a, with a, a unique body of knowledge and, and that influences how we describe things. I mean, even saying that something is cloudy and wispy requires an understanding of clouds, which you can't see out my window, but um, <laughs> um, that sort of thing. I thought it was actually really interesting in some of those old descriptions that I, that I gave um, where they were, um, if, you know, describing this nebula with um, just with comparisons to other things. One of the comparisons was to a mackerel sky, which means like a cirrus, a cirrus cloud sky, kind of the mm -hmm. mackerel being like the scales of the fish. So like that in itself was already, uh, you know, a, a, a figurative language there. So I'm not sure if I answered um, the person's question, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's hard and robotic. Well, um, I hope we don't sound robotic. Um. <laughs> That's kind of what I was going to expound on is I don't think there's a full delineation between it because you want to convey the image, you want to convey what's in it, but you also want to convey some of them like majesty, some of what mm -hmm. it makes you feel when yeah. you look at it. Like they are not it, separate. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah. No, I mean, that's that you're, you're getting at it exactly, Grant. Um, we want an emotional response. I mean, that is one of the major goals when we create these images is we want everyone to know about the wonders of the universe. And if that's our goal with the images, that needs to be our goal with the alt text as well. Okay, that's a great um, yes. way to end it. Um, <laughs> thank you all for your discussion on making astronomy accessible, and um, I look forward to the, uh, uh, the efforts in the future. To our audience, thank you for joining us. We will be back on December 5th. We will see you then. Thank you for watching. Thank you all. Thanks.